Will you join me now for a moment of prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our minds and hearts as we gather here together be acceptable to you, O Lord, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, with all due respect to my brother Jim Egan over there, who's also our church's advisor on the insurance policies that are reimbursing us for our office water damage, today's sermon is not about the wisdom of flood insurance. <laughs> it's about God's good gift of the Bible, about the good news that we share, the solid and reliable rock of Jesus Christ upon which our faith is built and upon which our church covenant still stands today, 253 years after our founding as a church. It's about God, the one whom the great 20th century German theologian Paul Tillich liked to call the ground of our being, not God in the sky, distant, in other words, as someone was reminding me in a church meeting this past week, God is not the fire escape of our lives, not just there whenever we might need help in a spiritual emergency, but God is the very foundation, what is most needed in our daily reality. God is always there, we proclaim, ever present as our spiritual foundation, the only sure and firm foundation for the human soul. Now we know this is true, we read it in the Bible, we sing it in our hymns, but as our Fairfield East Association Regional Minister Sarah Verasco said in her stewardship sermon on February 13th, if we want to find what is the real foundation of our lives, we can just take a look into our checkbooks. Where is your treasure invested? I give to our church, but by far my biggest investment is, I think, my house, mortgage, taxes, insurance, fuel, utilities. And as I said last Sunday, now we're also looking to pay tuition for my son's college which will be considerably more expensive, I think, than all those wonderful years of his Christian education, church school, youth group, confirmation. But I wonder what will ultimately have the most value to him when he's no longer living under that expensive roof. Pastor Amanda Warner at Prince of Peace Lutheran Church asked me, will ask all of us in our Brookfield clergy meeting, which do you think will give our church school kids more comfort at the end of their lives? Will they cling to their first soccer trophy on their deathbeds or their confirmation Bible? Will they use their dying breath to recite their times table or state capitals or the 23rd Psalm? In the words of the great hymn writer Edward Mote, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. So to stand on the teachings of Jesus Christ, it really helps if we know Jesus well as his story is told in our Bible. This is why in our United Church of Christ in the congregational tradition, which claims Jesus Christ as the only head of the church, not a bishop or a pope, but Jesus, we consider it essential to hand out Bibles, as we just did, to all our new members. Whether they're newly baptized babies who get their picture book Bibles, or the fourth graders who get those easier to read paperback Bibles, or our confirmands and adults who get this Bible, the New Revised Standard. Protestant heroes of the 1500s, like the Czech reformer Jan Hus, died in the flames of the Reformation for our right to read the very pew Bibles that we sometimes pick up by mistake, thinking it's our hymnal. Well, you know what a self-proclaimed Bible nerd that I am, so you know I'm biased, but I really hate it when people miss the opportunity to learn and grow spiritually from the greatest story ever told, and from Jesus, who was arguably our best and truest preacher. 
As Matthew tells us over and over in his gospel, Jesus had nothing but the greatest respect for his own Hebrew scriptures, our Old Testament. And for his people, he brought them to life with his parables, with his um, stories, which were ways, as we do in our preaching today, to put those ancient stories in modern terms that they could understand. My master's thesis in seminary, which included the skit that you just saw, made the case that Jesus, unlike most of the kind of dry academic preachers I had heard, Jesus was a great storyteller with an amazing sense of humor. And if you could hear us laughing in the church library this past Thursday morning at our Bible study, you would believe me. But the truth that Jesus teaches us is that unlike the scribes and Pharisees of his day who loved nothing better than to sit around in Torah study and who trusted in their own wisdom and righteousness above all, we don't find our way into the kingdom of heaven by earning it, by the trail of our own piously sewn merit badges. Jesus says it's his little ones, the children, who lead the way into the kingdom of heaven. In fact, he says if we don't turn and receive the kingdom of heaven as the simple gift that it is, like a small child would do, we would never enter it. I think that like the camel that is too laden down with worldly goods to make it through the narrow gate, we adults are sometimes too bound up with all the things in our life to receive what Jesus would say are the good gifts God would give us in the world of spirit, like his own simple teachings in the Bible. And these millions of trivial things make up the sand that Jesus says keeps our souls unstable, unsettled, off balance. He calls us to instead lay our lives on a foundation that is him and on the way of love that God teaches us in the Bible. So scouting, like our life of Christian faith, is not about what we can achieve in the end in terms of rank or station, but in learning to practice our faith each day by loving others. As Christians, Jesus calls us to put kindness over achievement and graciousness over righteousness. I'm grateful that I was taught that lesson in both my church school and in scouting. I thank God that my life's foundation was built on lessons from Jesus and not from this world, which will say to you not do unto others as you would have them do unto you, as we heard last week, but do unto, do, do unto others before they do it unto you. I loved what Leslie Sands said our dear friend Gert Ewing's high school said about her. Under her yearbook picture it said, where she met a, friend, a stranger, there she left a friend. There's no place on a resume of this world for a statement like that, but as a spiritual epitaph, it is high praise. On what is your life built? It's all too easy for us, I think, to forget what is real, what is solid, what is eternal and imperishable in these electronic lives that we lead with flickering facts and glittering consumer goods. So I hope your life is not built on your career or your bank account, the way people all around us are losing jobs or life savings. I hope it's not built on your um, health club membership either, because cardiac health and looking good is all great, but it doesn't guarantee us longevity. It is not the key to eternal life. One of my old friends who ended up with colon cancer after he gave up his favorite breakfast, the Midwestern bacon and eggs of his childhood for fruit and granola that his doctor recommended, after he was diagnosed and I saw him in the hospital, he said, I hated blueberries. I hated them, but I ate them religiously. I ate them for my children because they had antioxidants. But now, he said, I call them lie berries. <laughs> they did not prevent my cancer. But then when he turned to his church for help, when he was surrounded by his family of faith as he 
went through his treatment. I know he would have sung with the hymnist, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. As we enter into covenant in our wonderful church, we find our strength in Christ and in his promises to love us no matter what. As the living, resurrected body of Christ in the world, we come together in worship here, and I believe something actually does happen, something profound, something spiritual, something real. In church, we stand up together and we claim as solid a spiritual reality, the embodied power of God's love in Christian fellowship. Christians proclaim, you know, God incarnate, God here with us in the flesh, even in something as ordinary as a family breaking bread together around the kitchen table, or here at church in communion. In communion, we receive the body of Christ, but we're also called to enter into it, to become it. We become part of this great generation after generation chain of our ancestors. We become part of the biblical testimony of faith. We are proclaiming that God is still speaking and God's story is still being told even in this meeting house. Because preaching the good news takes many forms. Pass the peace to your neighbor, feel the firmness of their handshake. As you stand to bind the covenant, know that your brothers and sisters in Christ will help you to stand when you may stumble. We are trying as best as we can to be solid and dependable disciples who preach the good news just by what we do every day. Some of our youth, they heard the gospel preached by Ivan Park, who's remembered by these beautiful flowers here today. He wrote the gospel according to Ivan for our mission trip teams and for our Relay for Life as he stood with them in Jesus' name. Gert Ewing, she heard our faith preached not in anything I ever said much from the pulpit because I don't think she could hear much of anything, but she heard it in the music of our organ and our choirs, which is why she always sat right there with Marge so close to the music. She loved the children's choir. She heard the gospel according to the peeps. Gert Ewing knew God alive and in the flesh in the shining faces of the beautiful children of our church who I know led the way for her into the kingdom of heaven. Thanks be to God for this good news. Amen. <laughs>